What's up, everybody? It's your boy B. Scott with the Philadelphia Eagles. I just want to thank you all for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and leave a five-star rating. Fly, Eagles, fly. Thank you for tuning in to Eagles Brawl of the Brawl Network. Co-host Connor Miles here. Tyler, it's been a while, man. I'm Dude, glad you're back on the air. It's been too long, man. Uh, work has gotten in the way. Um, you've, you've flaked on me a couple times. So, uh, <laughs> no, it's been it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to get on the same. Dude, so... For those of you who don't, aren't sure yet, and by the way, thank you for tuning in on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, or YouTube, or however you are tuning in. I live on the East Coast, Tyler lives on the West Coast, and Johnny lives in the UK. It is hilarious trying to organize, <laughs> saying all together for a podcast episode. Please appreciate our consistency. Please appreciate it, because it has been tough, but Colin Cowher comes out and he proclaims Wentz being the next Russell Wilson, and Twitter took that and threw it under the bus. PFF actually didn't put Carson Wentz in their top 50 players. Now that I know you were talking off air to figure out why there was so much Wentz hate going on right now, but PFF didn't put him in their top 50, and then they described the next 10 players that should have made their top 50, and they didn't put him in that. So that's where Colin Coward decided to say, hey, like, Carson Wentz is now at this point the nice Russell Wilson, and then NFL Twitter pretty much was like, no, like he's not better than Dak, or majority of them. You know how it is. We we defend this guy nonstop. But you hit me up, and you're like, yo, it's time to make an episode. It's time to record finally. It's time to cut the BS with Wentz. That's what I'm going to call this episode. Cut the BS with Wentz. <laughs> so, Tyler, I got some stats. I got some key stats from at MaxDFL on Twitter. At Thomas RP93 on Twitter and my also my premium football pro football focus account. We got some good stats on here all together for you guys to show you that Wentz is statistically proven to be one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, easily top five. I put him in my top five, but and and, and before we get into the stats, uh right, I didn't want to get into the stats right away because oh people, good. Because, you know, I know I didn't want to drown this episode out with stats because, you know, people are always like stats are one thing. They can mean anything, but we'll add context and everything. I know. Right. But go ahead, Tyler. And, I, and ahead. you know, I love, you you, I love that you said the word context. There is no position in sports that requires more context than the quarterback position. Absolutely. And I love PFF. Uh, we can use it as a tool. I love analytics. Um, but I do think that every position, everything is just so contextual, uh, especially in, in, in football. Um, and, and I don't think it's, it's as simple as saying, you know, this guy has a good QBR or this guy's good under pressure. Or there was a stat that said, I think PFF released a stat that said Dak Prescott was one of the better deep throwers in the league, which is absolutely bonkers to me um, because he's not a good deep thrower. <laughs> it's there, there's context to every single situation. Uh, and you know, for, for Colin to come out and um, Colin's a Carson Wentz fan and he always has been. Uh, and, and, and it was good to see um, because I don't know what it is with people who watch Carson Wentz. You should be able to watch the guy and, and understand. I mean, it doesn't take very long to see what he can do and what he's capable of. Um, so I'm excited to, to talk about this because I mean, he's the face of the Eagles franchise and um, he's fucking good. <laughs> he's really good. To be fair. <clears throat> I don't think – I just want to clear this up before we get into this because I know there's going to be – we're going to bring up Dak Prescott a lot. And our fellow Brawl Network, Cowboys Brawl, will listen to this pod because they tell me that they do. I don't – I think Dak is a good starting quarterback. I do. I think he's top ten, just to be fair. I think he is good enough to win football games with. And I think most of his the, – the, the, the numbers that we harp on the most for him is how he performs against 500 teams, and we all know the numbers are. Uh, we don't have to get into that, but 
that I don't think that team's ever been good. I don't think the team around him, besides wide receiver, running back, and O line, has has been good enough for him to really win the, those type of games. I don't think I think Byron Jones and Robert Quinn and Demarcus Lawrence were the outliners on the defense last year, and now uh, Robert Quinn's gone and Byron Jones are gone. And they didn't replace him well, so I think the defense even be worse this upcoming year with Mike Nolan in charge. I think he's a horrible defense coordinator, but not to get too much into that. This is about Wentz, but statistically standpoint, I understand. I don't think Dak's the best deep thrower, but I think he can get the ball down the field and he has Michael Gallup and Mari Cooper, who are probably one of the best separators, especially Mari Cooper in the NFL, uh, creating separation. So statistical wise, his completion percentage downfield was great last year. It was 54, which is six in the NFL, and that's what they're going with with that. The numbers are because Amari Cooper and Michael Gallup performed. Dak got the ball there, and he performed. That's, yeah, that's all. yeah, and I, I didn't mean to, like, shit on Dak. I'm not one of those Eagles fans that's extreme that says Dak sucks. I mean, he's – when the Eagles are playing against the Cowboys, I get nervous going into the game. I mean, I'm, they're, Dak is a good quarterback. I mean, as much as he's a a running meme or, you know, as much as we, we joke with it, I mean, he I don't think that he's in and we'll probably get into it a little later on as far as tiers or, you know, where Wentz is compared to Dak. I don't think they're in the same tier. Um, but, yeah, Dak Prescott is a – he's a damn good quarterback. You know, you can't – it's hard to find the consistency that, that he has shown and proven, um, you know, in your first four years like he has. I mean, durability – uh, winning games and and yes, QB wins don't define a quarterback. But I mean, if you could be as consistent as he has, it it it's hard to to just look away or or you know put it sidestep it. It's it's impressive. Dak's impressive. I mean, his I think his biggest quality to him is his he shows up. Uh, ironically, he didn't week sixteen this past year, but um, he shows up in big moments. Man, um, I I respect Dak a lot. Um, Sometimes my, my I, he's a running joke on Twitter, but no, it, Dak Prescott's legit. So, um, no, I respect I, him a lot too. I I agree with you with everything you said. Once is better though. Yeah, hundred percent. For sure. Once is more talented from a talent standpoint. Throw the like we're gonna talk about stats a lot. I get it, but like you said, context is to be added to stats. So throw the stats out for a second. Talent standpoint, once is more talented, but it's you're you can't you you can't really sit here and point out ten quarterbacks that are better than Dak Prescott. Agreed. It's just the truth. So that's and, it. I don't want to get you like, all right, go ahead. Go ahead. You can go. No, ahead. no, 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 no. I have nothing. Right. I, I'm with you. I was just like, I don't want to keep going into like this is Eagles brawl. Let's let's keep going into the once talk. All right. Do you want to go on? Try going into some stats that I think back an argument of him being a top five quarterback. So let's already start off the bat with the longest active streak of games with a passing touchdown in the NFL with 19. That's a very tough streak to do, especially giving parts of the season where you're playing a top five, maybe even a top two defense. So hats off to Wentz with that, especially with given the fact that his best wide receiver he's played with, I would say from a talent standpoint is Deshaun Jackson. Do you agree? hundred percent. So, 100%. And he's playing with him only one game. And you already saw what happened that one game. They went off together. It was insane. The the second best wide receiver is Alshon Jeffrey, who he's gotten at the back end of his career without a doubt, and who has, I think, definitely bashed him to Josie Nay Anderson. I think it's Alshon. I don't care. We're not going to get into that, but I and, think it's and, well, Hold on real quick. I forgot. No, the best receiver that Carson Wentz has played with is Nelson Aguilar. We should know that. All right, now. man. All right. We get your hot takes <laughs> out I had to here. throw it in there, right. man. That's my guy. Oh, his best – his best receiver all time that he's played with was Zach Ertz, but his best right. wide receiver is Deshaun. So to have the lock, the lo- excuse me, the longest active streak of a passing touchdown in 19 games is incredible to me. That's very hard to do. That's why 19 games doesn't seem like a lot to everybody, and and the reason why that's the longest streak shows you. I mean, Wentz is a consistent, good quarterback and putting his team in position to win games. Now. He's the also the only quarterback in NFL history with three straight games of 30 completions and zero interceptions. That's insane. That's insane. Because the one thing that came out about Wentz coming out, I would agree that he struggled with the most, and it should in 2016, he would lock onto one read. And that's the thing that I think he's improved numerous times over the last couple of seasons. Uh, he needs more weapons to even show that a little bit more. But 
that stat proves to me that he could read the field better than most quarterbacks in the NFL. And it's and, sorry, go on. Oh, okay, uh, it's it's really cool to see because Wentz coming out was labeled a gunslinger. You know, mm-hmm. somebody who would it would take time uh, for him to you know when to take a risk, when not to. Um, so when you see these, you know, the nineteen or or the the three straight games of thirty completions and no interception, that's so efficient. Um, and and it also that's a we're talking about context here, you know. From a that, that's letting you know this offense just had no deep threat last year. Because is that the the thirty completions? Is that last year, twenty nineteen? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yep. The, the the team just it, it was so hard for this team to be able to stretch the field, and so this guy just had to live from short to intermediate, and it's nuts to see. I mean, he's got such a good arm; it's so talented. And I I tweeted the other day that, and whether it's I don't know if we're going to get into it later, but I, I do think that he is, he can be in the same tier as Pat Mahomes and w- with, with skills, positions, with, with the surrounding around him. I, I, I do think that Wentz is capable of that. And I don't think that we've seen it yet. 2017 is the closest thing we'll ever see um, or have seen. Um, it's just Pat Mahomes. Go ahead. Is better than Carson Wentz. I agree. We, we, we all know. Yeah, I agree. Can Carson Wentz play on the level Pat Mahomes has played? Yes. Yes. Because if you put Matt Mahomes, excuse me, you put Pat Mahomes in the Eagles offense last year, he is throwing around 27 to 30 touchdowns, which is what Wentz did. Yeah. Through 27. Yeah. I'm not, if you I, put Carson Wentz in the Chiefs offense with Tyree Kill, Sammy Watkins, Mikel Hardman, Travis Kelsey, Demetrius Harris, Demarcus Robinson, He's throwing he's going nuts. forty plus touchdowns, maybe fifty, maybe because that's this is where I think you have to give Pat Mahomes a little advantage. I don't think he would throw fifty right off the bat like Mahomes did. I think he would throw in the forties though, which I think he was going to do this year, and we'll get into that a little bit, I'm sure. But so that's why I agree with you. He's I don't think he's in the same tiers, but I only have two quarterbacks in my top tier in the NFL right now, and it's Russell Wilson, and Pat Mahomes. But that tier below it. Carson Wentz is undoubtedly in it, and we're going to keep going into these stats to prove why. Because the fact that he does this with the wide receiver talent that we that we alluded to, you could talk about the Zach Ertz's of the world. You could talk about the Dallas Goddard's of the world. That's fine, especially with the evolution of the tight end position. Those guys are definitely key components to Wentz's statistics. But the NFL is more of a passing league now, more than it's ever been before. So you need a quarterback to – provide these type of numbers on a consistent basis and for the Eagles to not trout out a single wide receiver, 1000 yard wide receiver for Carson Wentz in his career to trot out a wide receiver corpse last season that was completely depleted, didn't have a single wide receiver over 500 receiving yards. And of course he was the first quarterback in NFL history to, to throw for 4k yards in those circumstances. That speaks to the level of talent that he is. But again, football is a team sport. And if those guys around you are providing statistics like that, you're going to see why he's the only quarterback in the NFL history to do something like that. When you have guys like Aaron Rodgers, Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, Johnny Unitas, anybody that played the position before him and not be able to achieve something like that. The wide receiver position matters. 100%. 100%. Yeah. I mean, your sur- surroundings. I mean, how many times do we see a quarterback get off to their a hot start to start their, their career? And then, you know, after they get their big contract, a team struggles to put, you know, receivers or a surrounding around them and then they struggle. It's so one of the most impressive things to see from a young quarterback is can you carry something w- when you don't have a good surrounding? And that was what was most impressive with Wentz last year in 2019. Those last four games, I mean, you know, there's jokes about, you know, him throwing to, to GameStop employees or whatever, which is <laughs> is disrespectful to the guys on the field. But, yeah, I mean, the fact that he was able to do the things that he did and it, it, he showed that he can actually carry. He's not a system quarterback. You know, that's what – that's the biggest argument against, against quarterbacks who have success is, oh, it's the – No, no, because the coach. system runs through him. Uh, no, absolutely. So- the only time that Doug Peterson's offense didn't run through the quarterback was when Nick Foles was starting. But even then, he let Nick Foles make the biggest decision of Eagles history in the Super Bowl. So to ever, ever, ever say that is wrong because the court, this, the system runs through the quarterback in the center in, in this 
this specific offense. Because so, that was no, a narrative. Yeah. That was a thing that was being thrown out after 2017 was, you know, because Carson Wentz, he was about to be the MVP, got hurt. Then Nick Foles went in and won. So after that, then the entire narrative was Carson Wentz is a system quarterback. It's Doug Peterson. It's this and that. And it's bullshit. Carson Wentz is ridiculous. Own his Doug count. Peterson is one of the best strategic co- coaches in the NFL. Carson Wentz is the one of the best chess maker quarterbacks in the NFL. That's why they complement each other so well and are successful. But another thing that a narrative I want to crush is people think Carson Wentz can't get it done against good teams, but not every good team has a top 10 defense. I'll admit. So let's just get that out there right away. But again, most of them do. And Wentz is 11 and eight versus top 10 defenses in the NFL Throwing for almost 5K yards, it's 4,618 yards, 61% completion percentage, 36 touchdowns, 15 interceptions, and a 90.7 QB rating. I don't think Colin Coward's that crazy for putting him in the conversation that Russell Wilson's in due to the fact that Russell Wilson has had better wide receiver talent because Tyler Lock- there has not been a Tyler Lockett for Carson Wentz since he's been in the NFL. There hasn't been a DK Metcalf, really. I mean, so... The thing with the Seahawks was they couldn't build an offensive line whatsoever for Ron Russell Wilson, and he had to make plays without protection, and that's what makes him so great. Carson Wentz has to make plays at the end of the field mostly with guys that nobody expects anything from. So that's why he's comparing it to. He's saying we the Seahawks haven't done enough to put stuff around Russell Wilson to make it perfect for him, just like the Eagles haven't done enough to put stuff around Carson Wentz to make the passing game, which is an era of football that we're all in. Because, I mean, even Dak threw for 5K yards last year. I mean, I don't blame him with the weapons he had and the offensive line and protection he gets. But, I mean, it's a passing league. You need your quarterback to pass the ball a lot. And if you don't have a Michael Gallup and Amari Cooper type uh, impact at wide receiver, you're not going to do well. And I, I and the think, fact that he did is crazy. I think, like, I think, yeah, right. And I think what Colin's getting at is – Wentz has shown what he can do with less. So imagine what he can do with, you know, the surrounding. And I, I, I almost think that that segment that he had was was more so just dictated on what we're going to see. Um, it, when you get this guy, and, and last year I was I was you know pounding my 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 fists on the on the desk for 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 saying you know Deshaun and and Wentz together is going to be. Super fun, and we only got one game or one and a half of games. But if those guys play together for twelve to fourteen games, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, it's I, I, I want to see it. I want to see Carson Wentz with an actual surrounding around him because it's we haven't seen the best of Carson Wentz, despite what he's already shown, which is exciting as an Eagles fan. It's like you know, what are you actually capable of? And yeah, I think it's 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 flirting with what Pat Mahomes can do or has done, and I I, I think we, we you also mentioned as far as what Doug Peterson brings to the table. There are a couple things that Doug Peterson I have some issues with. I, I I think that Doug Peterson almost since Carson Wentz has been drafted, and then ever since Wentz had his injury, I think that Peterson has kind of sheltered Wentz in a sense of not expanding the playbook, not one, and and also personnel has played into it. He doesn't have you know, Tyree kills to send down the field. Um, but I do think the more speed and that's the, that's the cool thing about this year is if Deshaun gets hurt, there's a Marquise Goodwin, there's a Hightower, there's a Rager. There's still guys that we can still put in these positions to stretch the field still and make defenses respect it. And Carson Wentz's best ability is his arm and be able to extend plays. And so I, again, I don't think that we've actually seen the best of Carson Wentz, despite of what he's already shown. It, it's exciting as a fan because, like, what is what is the potential? I don't think we truly know. We definitely haven't seen the best for Carson Wentz. Nobody can argue. Okay, so let's just get it. Let me just – little. this is my own thinking from NFL, knowing players and stuff. Carson Wentz has not had the Tyree Kill, Sammy Watkins, or the Cole Hardman of the world. He has not had the Marvin Harrison, the Reggie Waynes, the Brandon Stokelys of the world. He has not had the rainy monster Dante Stallworth the Wes Welkers of the world. He's not had the, the Demarius Thomas, the uh, Eric Decker and the Wes Welkers of the world. 
those guys that have had the crazy quarterback seasons have had the Jordy Nelsons, the Randall Cobbs, the Donald Drivers, the Greg Jennings. He hasn't had that. Alshon, Torrey, and Aguilar were the best trio he's played with. And we all know that ever since Alshon Jeffrey had signed with the Eagles, his career has been on the downward. Torrey Smith only played one year with the Eagles because his career is on the downward. He's not that NFL now. Nelson Aguilar had just signed with the Raiders for $800,000 and might not make the roster with all the additions that they drafted. A wide receiver. He's gonna make the roster, bro. You you just gotta take the <laughs> God take the blinders off, my friend. So the point being, I mean, look, Doral Green Beckham's out of the NFL, Jordan Matthews is out of the NFL. You haven't given Carson Wentz any of those guys, so to expect him to have numbers like the Dak Prescott's of the world when you have Michael Gallup and you have Amari Cooper. Like the guys I mentioned before with all their historic seasons and the, and the wide receiver corps they've had, you can't expect these crazy, absurd numbers when you don't have the Julio Jones, the Muhammad Sanus, and the Calvin Ridleys to give your quarterback. It's yeah, that biggest, simple. Biggest surrounding or biggest supporting or support that Carson Wentz has had is his O-line. It's, it's what it's been. He's had a nice O-line from the jump, from his that rookie year. more into the run, too. Yeah. Because he still gets hit a lot. And he he's the type of quarterback that's going to hold on to the ball and wait for a play to be made. And sometimes the offensive line, especially an aging offensive line, has shown they can't keep up with giving him that amount of time that much anymore. So he has to get the ball out quicker. That offensive line, to me, benefits the run more than it does in pass blocking to him. Uh, in 2017, they had LeGarrette Blunt and J.H.I. And they were the third top uh, rushing offense in the league. Now they have Miles Sanders, who we'll get into later in the episode, who's going to be a superstar. So I to for people to sit here and say, well, look, uh, Peyton did it without an offensive line. Tom Brady has all these crazy guys that they just make good on the offensive line. Uh, I hate those narratives because I think they benefit the run game more than they benefit him passing because he has nobody to pass it to. Mm-hmm. I'm just yeah. passionate about it, man. I'm just because you can't sit here and say my quarterback does this and that, but he has this and this to throw it to. When I just told you, Wentz has never had that. Yeah, and and an O line can only take you so far. I mean, if the run game is, I mean, you could put eight in the box, but if you guys can't separate outside, then what the what the fuck is a quarterback supposed to do? Um, so, and and that's that's why we're excited for 2020. He's got weapons. He's got an O line on paper. It looks, I'm I'm excited as shit to see this. Right, this the speed opening up the the spread concepts in this you, West Coast offense is insane. Let me ask you, what is your project projection for Carson Wentz? Twenty twenty. He's throwing forty one touchdowns this year. Forty one. He's throwing not forty one. Forty one. No, forty one exactly. <laughs> he's, okay. he's throwing forty one exactly. He's throwing okay. for. I don't think he's going to throw for five thousand yards because Miles Sanders is going to go off this year, and I think he's going to get. Roughly sixty six percent of the touches uh, in the Eagles' backfield, and so he's going to go off. If he gets that, how much of volume I, I'm projecting, he's going to go off. So Wentz will not throw for five thousand yards like Dak did. This so you're past looking year. at like forty three hundred yards, forty one touchdowns, yes. something like that. I want to okay. say because he averages seven interceptions, so to say anything other than seven it feels weird at this point. But I think he's going to throw ten because I think they're going to open up the pass. Because no, it's not even that. He, they couldn't throw the ball deep with the speed. So that helped lower his interception totals because he's not going to make the crazy risky throw without a guy being separated downfield. That's not the type of quarterback one says anymore. He doesn't he, cause you're right. Peterson cradles him a little bit, but now they have the personnel to open up the offense more to go more downfield. The interceptions are going to pick up a little bit, but if he throws 10 to 11 and throws 41 touchdowns, I'm good. hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. That's fine with me. Yeah. So yeah, I think he's going to throw around 400, 4,300 some yards and forty one touchdowns. I his completion percentage should be even better too because he was ninth in deep ball accuracy last year and he had no deep ball threats. So Did the opportunities know? weren't even there. The That's opportunities weren't even there. Man. Dude, seventy seven. Uh, excuse me, 50, 52 passing attempts, deep ball passing attempts, where he had one game where he had a legit deep threat in Deshaun Jackson. And he threw it the ball down the field 52 times. I would expect that number to go up around like to like the 77 range 
it's the seventies at least, maybe even the eighties with the the speed that they added. So those numbers should even be even better. It should be even a lot better. So, uh, dude, I don't see how he doesn't throw for 40, one, 40 plus. I think it's gonna be forty one exactly though. <laughs> I love the exact forty one predict pred, uh, prediction. I love it. Look. Second best passer rating in the red zone since 2016, which was his rookie year, which is 107.9. It only trails Drew Brees, which we've all known Drew Brees is one of the most prolific, accurate passers in NFL history. Since entering the league, Wentz is tied with Russell Wilson for second most wins against 10-plus winning teams, having nine, trailing Tom Brady's 11. So that's pretty big to me. I don't know about you. That's a big thing to say about your quarterback that not QB many wins, can. bro. Hashtag QB wins. See, I don't even, I don't even, I'm not huge on QB wins, but there's a reason why the top quarterbacks in the league are on that list at that area and the ones that aren't, aren't. So that's all I'm saying. Mm. 72 touchdowns to two interceptions in the red zone in his career, which is a 36 touchdown interception ratio. That is impressive. That, that one is, like I said earlier, I kind of hit on it. Wentz coming out was known as a gunslinger, and for him to be that efficient in the red zone is just wild to me. That 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 is that's probably been the most where I didn't expect. Here's where I say this is Doug. They yeah. they've gone heavy on the twelve personnel. Yeah, when you have tight ends like Goddard and Ertz, because I'll tell you, looking back on last season, even when I was at games, when they because they ran heavily twelve personnel in the red zone. One of those guys, and it was mostly Goddard, was open, and Wentz might have missed him with his read. One of those guys is always open and will make the play that you need to make, and that incredibly boosts the red zone help. So there's where I'm going to give more credit to Doug than I am to Wentz because I think the way that this came up in the red zone makes it too easy for him not to be this good. But, again, that takes an incredible amount of talent to have a 72 touchdown to two interception ratio right there. And red that's zone. that's what's exciting too about this this upcoming season is they have the speed to get to the red zone. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times when when teams are like that, you know, it's the fast break offense. They can struggle. they have the running back too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Sanders it's, breaks it's, open those huge runs. I know. I don't want to. I know. We're gonna say yeah. I don't want to do it. <laughs> no, but yeah, no. Straight up though, run game. And can you go to twelve personnel? Can you actually squeeze the field? And for them to have so much success in a tight tight area. Um, they they don't just have speed and and that's the cool thing about this offense and the cool thing about Wentz and Peterson this year is they're so they're just so multidimensional you know you can we could stretch the field but if if you have a bunch of you know corners who are really good in coverage and we can we can compact the game and we can make this a 12 personnel game and play in between the numbers or we could spread you out and then we could give the ball to our our superstar running back in Miles Sanders they're, they're, this offense is going to be there. It's not just it's not one dimensional. It, there's so many different ways you, they can beat you, and I think that's the most exciting thing about this upcoming year. Despite even with injuries, that's been the biggest thing too. Is going into this season, we say you know Deshaun or Tory or you know, but or Mike Wallace. It, it, if these guys get hurt, there is now depth, and that's the big big thing. Is 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 there is depth with these injuries? So I'm expecting a huge year. So I'm glad you you hit on that because the the depth there is what's important. They always had that one guy to lean on for speed, and if he got hurt, whoop. And Mike Wallace got hurt in 2018. They they the best speed that they can get was Golden Tate, and we all know that was a disaster. If they had two slot wide receivers that they couldn't put in the slot, didn't know how to use them. 2019, Deshaun won game. That was it. I'm very unfortunate, but that one game was amazing. I was there, loved it. Watched Deshaun right in my face score. Uh, I think Deshaun will play at least 12 games this year. So that's – it. the dividend – here's the thing why a lot of people – I don't want to get too much into this because I want to continue on with Wentz, but everybody cares – Johnny especially, and I try to get Johnny off this, and we'll, him and I will continue talking about this on the pod. He cares about the X wide receiver position a lot and how a player has to play to that specific skill set. With, with how much they play 12 personnel, if they have two playmakers on the outside, Wentz and Goddard can eat underneath as much as they need to. And those playmakers on the outside can get the separation downfield they need to. I'm fine with just having a Rager and Deshaun line up on the outside and Ertz and Goddard at tight end. I'm I'm good. It's 2020, like, man. Ex- that's the thing, though. 
So the Eagles could never do this before, though, Tyler. They could they could never do this before, though. They always had wide receivers that were pigeonholed in one spot. Your boy Aguilar could not do anything on the outside. My boy, relax. Relax. Only Um, only thing Aguilar (laughs) was productive in was when he took advantage of slot and nickel corners. He did well. I agree. Jordan Matthews could not win on the outside. He could only play the slot. JJ was taking a white side. Now people are saying – now people – because I know you're not one of these people. You have faith in him, but you're not one of these people that are saying this. But now people are saying, well, you know, J.J. had to learn all these different positions, so I mean, we shouldn't really criticize him too much. But you ha- they can't be forced to pitch and hole guys into one spot anymore with, with all the speed, with all the versatility that they have. Anybody that's who not played how... football, man, like, I mean, and yeah, I, yeah, true. I, that's what I'm saying. The, every wide receiver needs to know play multiple positions. Can you just fucking play, bro? Can you line up and yes. can you get open? That's really what it is. It comes down to can you get the fuck open or can you not? Like, it's, it, I don't give a shit about X or Z or Y. Like, bro, can you, when it's man on man, it you doesn't need matter. separation. That's and it. And the Eagles never get it. And that's they it. never have it. And now they finally look like they might be able to. So, number 86 that's has all been the only one that's been consistent to get open. That's it. Yeah, that's all. All Evan needs is some separation, and he's never had it for a consistent amount of bases, at least. So, second lowest interception percentage of of quarterbacks in NFL history one one point seven zero percentage. Shown Aaron Rodgers one point three nine, and I mean people are gonna be like, "Well, he's been injured a lot." Well, he missed eight regular season starts and sixty four appearances which is one less than Deshaun Watson. Now everybody wants to go in and say, well, Deshaun's was one injury and once has had multiple, but if he's had multiple, then he's not missing that many games for having multiple. So to say he's injury prone is wrong. That's absolutely false, but he does have durability concerns and they were back dating back to North Dakota state. He's had visit times where you had to sit out for injury. So not injury prone, but durability, I would say is an issue. And you just hit it. Perfect. You just hit it perfect. Durability and and injury prone. Okay. Injury and, and shouts to Bryn Swartz. Okay. <laughs> Real quick. Bryn Swartz. Because I get into it with him all the time on Twitter. He's a he's a very good follow. He's a very good interaction. It's it's good. It's good talk. He labels Carson Wentz, and, and a lot of people do, injury prone. That bothers the shit out of me. It, it, He's not injury prone. That means somebody who struggles to stay on the field. If you could play out of four seasons, two 16-game seasons, you are not injury prone, especially for how much you, he's only missed eight games in the regular season. You are not prone think, to injury. Go ahead. Question for you. Question for you. Do you think Michael Vick was injury prone? Uh, that's he like was guaranteed to miss the start of the season. Yeah. Guaranteed. Yeah, I, 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 again, I don't think it's – yeah, I mean, I think he's – I think I would say because he was guaranteed. I I, I, I trust I, 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 I trust much one, less than I one full team six. Yeah, I, oh, because yeah. I knew he was going to get hurt. And yeah. but and then of course everybody's going to say, well, his style of play is different than Wentz. I mean, they're both risk takers. Obviously, Vic was the much better ru- runner, but they're both risk takers where they would are susceptible to hits. So would you? Okay, next question. Would you label Donovan McNabb as injury prone? No. No. Donovan okay, McNabb. so Vic played only – by the way, I was right. Vic only played one full season, and twice, three times, he's played three, 15 games. So – but, yeah, so you don't label Donovan McNabb as injury no. prone? No. Okay, no. so he's missed a couple of seasons, but he's also played a majority of yeah. his career in full Just seasons. like Big Ben. So. Big, ben Big Ben – Big Ben takes a lot of hits. He's he he stands in the pocket. He carries. Oh, yeah. so you wouldn't consider Ben Roethlisberger injury prone? Injury you consider prone? Consider dur- no. dur- durability issues. So exactly. that's where Wentz is, and that's where I'm in with him too. Those guys, I I would consider Vic injury prone because you're guaranteed to have an injury with him. But the rest of those guys, you were you it, if they got injured, okay, it happens. They have durability issues, but they were guaranteed to give you full seasons at points throughout their careers. I think Wentz will be the same. And, again, two two full seasons without – I know he left the playoff game, but any quarterback in that position, any quarterback that gets spearheaded by Javadian and Clowney the way that Carson Wentz did is out of the game. And in this league, with concussion protocol, is out of that game. That was a say, gruesome hit. It was all over Twitter immediately after it happened. The NFL reviewed it right away. Like, it was a – and you know how they are with concussion protocol. He did the right thing for his health. He did the right thing for his future. I applaud him. He did, it was tough to do in the playoff game, 
But to sit here and fault him for getting hurt for that hit, you're misguided. Yes. The only thing with, with Wentz is there are times where it's unnecessary for him to extend a play. And and I think that comes with time. It's and I think that the fumbles. It's, yeah, it's, the fumbles it's, too. It's his it, biggest it, enemy. Yes. It, it, it's almost, yeah. That's there, why. There are, go ahead. People compare him to Brett Favre. I exactly think they're on clo- they're close to it. I think he's less. I think he he's, takes less risk than Brett Favre, but he tries to make something happen when there's nothing there, and it results in the fumbles. And if he can tone that down a bit, and hopefully there's more downfield opportunities where he doesn't have to, because in 2017 he didn't have to that much. There was a lot of things opening up, and a lot of things he was able to do that year. I think if it happens the same thing this year, then the fumbles won't be as big as an issue, but. Uh, not to kill your whole thoughts. Go ahead. No, Keep you're right going. though, and and that's what I'm getting at is is Carson Wentz is it's a blessing and a curse with how competitive he is because obviously you want your quarterback to be competitive, but there are times where it's a first down and he's frustrated after two three and outs, and you know you could see it on Carson's face <laughs> when he's going to like throw into double coverage or triple coverage. You're know, like, yo, like just relax, you know, trust a scheme. Trust your offense. But again, when you deal with injuries and you can't stretch the field and you're getting annoyed because the ball's not moving, I get it. I mean, any competitor would get it. Like, you should be able to understand that. So it's it's a blessing I'm, and a curse. I'm glad you're hitting on this, though, because that's my biggest issue with him is once things start breaking down and he has to start becoming Superman, sometimes he gets erratic and sometimes he gets flustered. And and when you're when you're playing the great defensive, because there's a reason why it's an 11 and 8 record versus top 10 defenses and not better than what it is, is when he gets flustered. Because I can think of that game versus the Saints in 2018 where he oh, just man. nothing yep. was going his way, yes. completely flustered, four picks. That's when they decided to shut him down because just he just could not play to the level he he wanted. He knew he was capable of, and things just were breaking down around him. And he just could not do anything. It, when he looks like that and it happens, that's where I'm like, come on, man. You have to keep composure. You have to make the play. You have to be the guy that we rely on you to be. And that's why I can't put him in the Mahomes and Wilson tier. But tier two right underneath it, absolutely, for sure. Uh, last thing I want to hit on before, and then I'll let you end it with Carson Wentz because we got to get into Miles Sanders to round up the episode and why I think he's a superstar in the making. Uh I wrote an article of Carson Wentz in 2019 for Fan Sided. This is coming off of the 2018 season when they decided to go with him and Foles went to Jacksonville. Uh, I pulled up some stats that I wrote from that. And I, it was, I wrote, he was the first quarterback in NFL history to throw for 10,000 yards, 70 touchdowns, and fewer than 30 interceptions through 40 games. That's incredible, especially given the fact that we talked about the receiving talent that he's had. Owns the longest streak in NFL history for throwing one touchdown and no more than one interception through 22 straight starts at the time, which he beat out Matt Ryan for, who Matt Ryan had 21. This is a very talented quarterback, and the the, the people that harp on him for not being that good harp on injuries and then harp on numbers. And I just explained to you both very vividly with Tyler. I felt like we did. Like I said, he didn't have he doesn't have his Tyree Kill, Sammy Watkins, Nicole Hardman's of the world, he doesn't have his Marvin Harrison, Reggie Waynes, Brandon Stokely's of the world, doesn't have his Wes Welker, Randy Moss, Donnie Stoller, Aaron Hernandez, Gronkowski. I can go on, man. He doesn't have those type of legit weapons consistently that those guys had to put the numbers that they've been able to. And now, hopefully this season with the speed added, there's a healthy Deshaun, a Jalen Rager, who I think is gonna have a midseason outbreak just like miles sanders did uh, you're looking MVP. at a way better more outlook for carson wentz MVP. going forward and i think his stats will finally start to shine some focus on how good he can be and i hope that what we just discussed and how we were tired of talking about or everybody talking down on him uh this episode gave some clarity to that and why we felt that way and uh tyler anything you want to round this out with carson Wentz talk Nope, other than he's the MVP of 2020. You think he's going to win MVP this season? I think it's he's a real real chance for sure. I think yeah. he's a candidate. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if he's going to win it. I mean, yeah, I mean, what are I the think chances? he's a candidate. The field, but, um, I mean, I would feel pretty comfortable to, I don't know. I just, think they're really, I, I just think they're really going to balance the offense this year like they did in 2017. I think they're really going to lean on the run more, especially with Sanders so? year two. Yes, 
I think I, they I, have to. I, I think, think they're they, gonna. I think they're gonna kind of like unleash it a little bit, and I think they're gonna kind of take the the. I mean, man, they were the, they approach. were they were the third rushing offense, and one still threw thirty three touchdowns in his twelve right. starts. So I mean, it. I think they'll I'm be just, a little less run heavy than twenty seventeen. I think they'll be okay. a little less. I'm just thinking from a defensive standpoint, uh, especially with this pandemic going on. I would want them. I want. I would want to own the time of possession again. I would yeah, want to heavily not, own that, and I'm going to lean on the run more. So that's especially with the secondary, completely new secondary. The chemistry for them is not going to. I don't expect it to happen right away. I think the secondary is going to click around probably week six. Yeah. I think when you finally see or seeing the secondary click, because I think Malcolm Jenkins and that leadership and the quarterback of that defense losing him is going to just that impact. I don't know. You can just say, I think Darius Slay can replace some of it. I don't know if he can replace all of it right away. I think it's going to take some time. So once that second, I think that's why you want to go ahead and own the time of possession. Like you did in 2017, when they were one of the top teams in doing so. And you have Miles Sanders who, again, on a rookie contract, fresh legs, start giving him the workload of bell cow. And we'll get into it right now of why I think Miles Sanders is on his way to becoming a superstar. So, Define superstar. Do you think LaShawn McCoy was a superstar for the Eagles? I do. Okay, so yeah. He's going to be on that he's going to be on that wide length at running back. You think you think Miles I think Sanders. so for sure. Okay? Mhm. I think so for Tell sure. Me. So, make me buy I'm going to you. I'm going to Okay, so I think you've been a guy that wants to, them to sign Devontae Freeman, correct? Is that if, Are you wanting them to bring in a running back? financials, but yeah, I, I do. And you want them to bring in a running back? What's that? You want them to bring in a running back? It's not mandatory. No, I don't want you to think that. No. Okay, but, good. Yeah, I don't want them to bring in a running back. <laughs> okay, I think they want. I, no, because I want them to roll with what they have. Because if you don't, if you don't, if you think that they should bring another running back to tote the carries with him, then I don't think you see the vision that I do of Miles Sanders becoming a star. And I'm here's why I'm going to tell you why. Through weeks thirteen through sixteen, again, this was. On our fantasy episode this past Monday uh, with Tyler Buecher, Fantasy Gurus, a lot of these this two stats come from him, and I think they paint a clear picture of why I think Miles Sanders should be the lead back for the Eagles this year. Through weeks 13 through 16, he averaged 23 touches per game. That's bell cow-ish. Especially when you consider the fact that Darren Sproles' role is a very viable role in Doug Peterson's offense, and I think Boston Scott has a full handle on that this year. So... You're going to, like I said earlier in the episode, I want to see Miles Sanders get at least 66% of the touches out of the Eagles' backfield this year. Uh, so that's proof he can handle a bell cow type workload right there. He averaged 23 touches per game towards the end of the season where you really lean on a running back the most. I think that's incredible, especially considering the fact that he started off slow in the year, like we all, everybody knows. We've talked about it before. Eagles Twitter hit on it really hard before. Uh, but he took it on. A whole new level once Jordan Howard went down. And at the end of the season, he really showed you what kind of running back he can be. And I think we should use our recency bias on this one and buy into Miles Sanders stock. So, again, he was one out of 10 running backs over the past 10 years as a rookie to have 50 receptions. That proves to you that Miles Sanders is a dual threat quarterback, uh, excuse me, a dual threat running back. That is an incredibly vitally important key component of an offense to have in this passing era of football. I'm going to tell you why teams value the receiving ability from running backs and history and rosters right now in the NFL proves to you exactly why new England is forced to heavily rely on James white in their offense more than Sony Michelle due to his receiving ability. And that being better than Sony Michelle's Cowboys, even this past, this past season had to take Zeke off the field one of the top three paid running backs in the NFL because Tony Pollard offered a skill set that Zeke did not, and that is receiving. So Tony Pollard had to eat into one of the top paid running backs carries. Austin Eckler made the Chargers' life so much easier when Al Gore decided to hold out because he can run the ball and he is a receiving threat. And now they moved on from Al Gore and they didn't even pay him. They... They're paying Austin Eckler modest money, and I think they won that that deal in the end. 
So now even the running back, even the running back last year that was drafted before Miles Sanders, Josh Jacobs, in the first rounds of the Raiders, the year after they draft him, they go into the third round and they draft this guy named Lynn Bond Jr. out of Kentucky, who is probably going to be the receiving running back in that backfield because Josh Jacobs cannot perform in that area. Sanders gives the Eagles a threat at both the vertical passing game and an outside zone, inside zone runner that they haven't had since LaShawn McCoy. That's why I think he's heading down that southern path. And the reason why I want to keep going back and harping to the Christian McCaffrey comparisons and why yeah, I think he's on his pace. I don't know if he's going to be the caliber of player Christian McCaffrey is. But I think he's going to be the star player that Sean McCoy was with the Eagles. He had 241 more yards from scrimmage than Chris McCaffrey did in his rookie year. And the situations were incredibly similar. Jonathan Stewart was eating into a ton of the carries, just like Jordan Howard was when he was healthy. And that was in his rookie year when Chris McCaffrey started off, I would say, I, I, I would say he started off rather slow. He was more of a better receiver that year than he was a runner. But still, altogether... McCaff- with, in, again, with 50 less receptions than McCaffrey had, Sanders had 241 more yards for scrimmage still in his rookie year. I think there's enough there to suggest that Miles Sanders is on his way to stardom. And I believe the fantasy hype. I believe you take him in the first round for sure. How many jerseys of Miles Sanders do you own? Do you have like green, black, one. and white? Just one. no, I just have one. <laughs> just, <laughs> I was, I know, I, you're right. I am super high on him, and I was coming out of the draft. I had him I'm, as running back one. I I'm had him funny. over Jacobs. I I think the the biggest thing uh, is he could pass block, um, which means he is staying on the field. Uh, and I mean, obviously, his ability to to run. He he he's in the receiving game. He's everything. He's everything you want. So Tyler, um, Tyler. Just answer this for me real quick before you go on. Just answer me this real quick. Miles Sanders can pass block. He can average 23 touches per game. And he can give you a vertical threat in your passing offense. Why do you take Miles Sanders off the field unless it's for short yardage carries or goal line carries that Boston Scott can easily fill? Why? Why do you take him off the field for any other running back and waste cap resources that you don't really have much of when you can have when he just showed you he can pass block, he can catch, and he can average a bell cow total. So, a couple things. If you can, and and I agree, I think Miles Sanders is. I, I have mentioned earlier, like like you, you kind of hit on it. I have mentioned bringing in because I expect Doug uh, Doug Peterson's thinking is has always been running back by committee, always has been. Uh, so I mean, Jay Ajayi was the best running back, but. There was still Blunt. There was still Clement. There was Smallwood. There, there's always it's always been multiple guys. So when they lost Howard and didn't bring him back, my anticipation was they're bringing somebody in, you know. And I still think that I still think that they're going to. If they don't, then I expect Sanders to statistically be one of and and also I mean athletic ability and you know consuming it all in. I think Sanders is one of the better backs moving forward into 2020. But why you take him off the field is maybe long-term thinking of we do know how talented this guy is. We don't want to make him a bell cow for two to three years and then not pay him. You know, what is the thinking long-term? And that's my only thing is going into 2020, yes, Miles Sanders is – I'm expecting a huge year and I'm, I'm just as excited. But why you take him off the field or why you do some, uh, sign somebody is – one, Peterson's thinking and what it has been. And and two, again, how much do you want to put on Sanders in such a short time? And we know about running back sh- uh, shelf life. Do we want to add to that? Do we want to risk it? I mean, it's it, it's going to be I, – I've wondered that because I, I he's already surpassed my expectation. I did not love Sanders coming out. And what he's turned into – he started off slow last year, and then he he grew into like you you you've hit on. He is a legit three down running back. He can do everything. You do not have to take him off the field. I just my worry is like you just said, 
I don't know if the Eagles will pay him what it needs to they pay him once his rookie contract's up. So that's why I think why waste time when you have you have him Especially when you can replace it, right? on a rookie contract. Yeah, it's a replaceable position. But why would you waste time taking your best threat off the field? Because if they sign a veteran running back, I expect it to be LaShawn McCoy. Unfortunately. Ew. I expect it. I know. Because I don't think he can give that much anymore. Here's what I would do. This is what I personally do. So I was all with you, of course. I At the beginning of the year, I mean, all season, I was like, they're running back by committee approach. They're going to sign either bring back Jordan Howard back at a discounted rate since he missed so much time. I didn't expect the Dolphins to give him the money that they gave him. I'm glad the Eagles didn't. Or to bring somebody in to compliment Sanders' skill set. But then you start studying this stuff that I just said that shows you that he can handle a bell cow role. Then you start studying Boston Scott's role, which is easily Darren Sproles' role in Doug Pierce's offense, which, by the way, Doug, Darren Sproles always had a role. He just wasn't always healthy for that said role. Now they have the guy that they can fill it with in Boston Scott, and I don't see the envision any way that they eat, they don't put Boston Scott on the field to s- serve that specific role. But now you have Corey Clement, who has struggled since his rookie year, but, I mean, can still give you something out of the backfield if healthy. You have Adrian Killens you have as an undrafted free agent who I think offers you kick return ability at least two, which you don't you haven't had a consistent kick returner in years. And he also offers you a receiving threat out of the backfield, which I would add, I would argue you would should add more than you should add from a physical guy, a bruising guy. What if they do want to go to a bruising guy? They have Michael Warren out of uh, Cincinnati. I wouldn't allocate any more resources to running back. Yeah. They don't have the money to. Yeah. I would Miles Sanders is trending so much upward, keep riding it. Yeah. No, I'm with keep that. Keep riding it. I'm with that mindset, and, and, and I was kind of trying to play devil's advocate, but no, I agree. It, it, well, no, because people, more people – I think uh, the more popular opinion is what you said. I'm just disagreeing with it because I think – I don't think people – No, but at the end I of the day, I think a lot of people get stuck in box scores. Point. I think that's the biggest point is, is this position, running back position is – it's so – I, it's okay. I, there's a there, okay. There's a fine line. If you have a stud running back like a Zeke or like a Le'Veon Bell, you can't. Yes, running back position is is easy to replace, but you can't tie that into finding studs at the position. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's not just Ezekiel Elliott's just walking around that you could just say, "Hey, this is my new lead horse back who could do everything." And I think people sometimes mistake that. It's mm-hmm. Yes, the running back position is replaceable, but it's if you have a stud, it's not that easy. So, but where the trend is going for Sanders, yes, I, I, if they weren't, I, 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 it's a position that I completely have full trust in. I, right. I, Boston Scott is a stud. Like uh, what he can do and bring to the table, he, he's good in the red zone. He's good in. I, I, I am, I am in. I have full belief in the running back position. I don't think it needs to be addressed, but. I also wouldn't mind if they if they sign something for, you know, a, a vet minimum. You know, I mean, whatever. It's but also moving forward. Right. I, but I, I mean, I if they want, it, I feel like if they wanted to sign a running back, it'd be done. It's not like people are. I agree. Knocking down Devontae Freeman's door. It's not like people are knocking down LaShawn McCoy's door. But everything going only, on is also running into that though, with with contracts and stuff. I mean, with with plus because the, they were also interested in Carlos Hyde, and then he signed. They could have yeah. if maybe if he would have said yes to them. He could they could have signed him so it's not like I, i'm arguing it's I, i'm arguing my opinion like this is not i don't think this is how they view it i think you're right i think they will, are still surveying the market i think once they come to training camp and they see where they're at the position they're gonna want because i don't know if i do i Clement's not a lot to make the team but Maybe if they, they don't him. if like, they don't the they're position set. is I, yeah, they're set you're absolutely yeah. right that's if they the can, thing uh, I'm just arguing. Run your offense majority, your rushing offense majority through Miles Sanders, Boston Scott, and if Adrian Killens can give you something out of receiving threat, a kick returning threret, boom, perfect. If Corey Komet can come on the field for some screens like he did in 2017 and perfect them, and cool. maybe some inside zone runs, boom, cool, couple carries there. You you don't know what you have a left tackle, and I would worry about that when you have Carson Wentz a quarterback. You don't know legitimately yet who's your cornerback too i doubt you sign anybody but still you don't know you don't know what you have at linebacker you don't know if Jernard avery and joshua are ready to replace Vinny curry don't 
don't take away the resources to answer at least one of those questions at running back when you have a superstar in the making that I vividly argued why I think he is. And also on that is let's just say they go into the season with Sanders. They don't sign somebody. Sanders gets hurt and they need somebody. It's a pretty easy going back to the original point is it's pretty easy going in and they saying, struggled hey, with it in 2018 though. That's true. So that's why with people Adams probably and say, yeah. so and, that's yeah. probably so that's probably why if if you brought that point, I'm sure other people would too. Well, what if we're in that position again? You can't afford to think like that though. Yeah. You can't afford to think Miles Sanders is going to get hurt. I mean, Carson Wentz can get hurt. We're screwed if he gets hurt. Yeah. Uh, Deshaun Jackson, Jalen Rager can both get hurt. If they both get hurt, that speed position is looking a little sketchy now. So uh, I, I, you, you, you can't afford to think like Austin that. Austin Scott that, would be pretty cool in fantasy if Sanders did get hurt. <laughs> yeah, I just don't think – yeah, then you definitely still have to go out and get somebody. But, I mean, nobody's knocking down LeSean McCoy's door, so uh, – I mean, yeah. there's I'm, a trade I'm market. So cool off that idea, by the yeah, way. It's, like, just, oh, no, I don't think he can give you anything. Dude, yeah. all right, I'll say it for the last time because I know we said it on the episode with Ed. If the head coach that drafted you knows you better than anyone in the league, doesn't trust your legs or your contribution enough to dress you in the playoffs or the Super Bowl, I'm yeah. pretty sure you don't Definitely. have enough left in the tank. So – the only reason why I say him and why I think it's going to be him is, number one, how he is grossly loyal to those type of guys, and LaShawn fits that that mold. Number two, the money. They can't afford to play Freeman $4 million, and that's what he wants. They can't – McCoy probably would sign for the veteran minimum and not care. So that's, that's the only reason why I say it's probably going to be him, but I wouldn't even bring a running back in. If you can make Corey Clement and Andre Jackson free agent productive, why can't you make a Michael Warren and Adrian Killens? Which Adrian Killens is a very, very, very dynamic playmaker, I think, and could be something in this Eagles offense. Why can't you give those guys a chance? Fresh legs, undrafted free agent contract. Why can't you give them a chance? Yeah, I'm with it. I'm with that. I agree. If you're going to put four million somewhere, I'd rather it be a take a chance on a D end or a yeah. Or a line you have to bring Curry back or bring Peters back. With that yeah. four million, that's what I would say. But all right, anything else you gotta add, Tyler? We good? All love right, man. That was other. a good episode. Everything going on, man. Love each other. I know. Yes, please Fucking spread some love, please. man. And stop Social hating on Carson Wentz place right now. And please stop hating on Carson Wentz. Yes, that too. Cut the BS with Wentz. <laughs> All right, thanks for tuning in, Eagles. We're all we'll be back with another episode soon. Uh, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, however you're listening, please five star ratings, reviews, share the episode. We greatly appreciate it. Connor and Tyler here signing out. Peace.